Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and KETAM Enforcement Institute, sponsored by the ABA Criminal Justice Section. This session is entitled, Settling a F excuse me, a FDA Case. Before I introduce our panel, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Cone Cone and Colapinto LLP is the supporting sponsor for the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and KETAM Enforcement Institute. Thank you for your support. Moderating this session is Sarah McLean. Sarah is an Assistant Director with the Department of Justice in the Civil Fraud Section. Sarah, you may proceed with the program. Thanks very much, Courtney. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing a terrific panel uh, today to talk to you about settlement. Uh, first off, we have uh, Steve Altman. Um, Steve is a mediator at Altman Dispute Resolution Services. Uh, he has mediated over 40 False Claims Act cases. And before going into the mediation business himself, he was an assistant director in the fraud section at the at Maine Justice, where I work. Um, and uh, he uh, retired from there in 2004. He was already an expert in negotiations and settlements um, before becoming a mediator. Uh, next, we have Sarah Frazier, who's from the law office of Sarah Frazier. She represents whistleblowers um, in false claims act cases and has been doing that for 15 years. Um, she has her own firm in Houston, founded in 2019, and has experience uh, across the False Claims Act practice in healthcare cases as well as SBA fraud, government procurement. Um, her experience includes multiple healthcare fraud felony trials. Kirsten Mayer is a partner at Ropes and Gray uh, in the uh, healthcare and life sciences space. She represents companies and individuals in civil and regulatory enforcement matters and related complex litigation. She's spending significant time at present on issues related to COVID-19 um, stimulus spending uh, and related topics. And finally, we have Kirsten Nedwick from the Attorney General's Office for the State of Texas. She's the Deputy Director and Legal Counsel in, the, in that office's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Um, she's been there since 2003. Uh, she is a, a self-described Yoda for multi-state QUITAM settlements. In the False Claims Act arena, she's the co-chair of the National Association of Medicaid Fraud Control Units, uh, also called the NAMFUKU uh, Global Case Committee, and the previous co-chair of uh, the NAMFUKU Global Case Committee's QUITAM subcommittee. Um, so we have significant, uh, together the group has very significant experience in False Claims Act settlements, and we're excited to share that with you today. We're going to kick it off with um, Sarah. Oh, Chris, I should say before we get going that uh, Kristen Nedwick and I, um, as government lawyers, will be offering our own views, not the views of our agencies. Um, Sarah Fraser is going to kick us off um, with some of the basic sort of statutory background, um, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page about um, the framework for settlement. And then we have a number of topics that we've picked that are sort of more advanced topics that we'd like to discuss with you and with one another. Thanks, Sarah, if you could take it away. I will, and I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible. For, we've got sort of an ambitious number of slides, um, and really I just want to sort of touch on some of the statute, what basically what the False Claims Act has to say about settlements specifically. And so we'll cover dismissal, fairness hearings, and some items to be negotiated that are contained in the statute. Next slide, please. So um, let, let's start with dismissal or specifically the ability of the relator to dismiss uh, 31 U.S.C. 3730B1 um, specifies that the relator cannot do that him or herself. It has to be done with the consent of uh, the court and the attorney general, the written consent. Um, next slide. So their scenario under this provision would be what, what happened in Agape, where the relator is um, quite anxious to um, settle and dismiss, um, but the government opposes it. And in, in the Agape case, there was sort of an interesting scenario where the reason why, the, what was driving this was the fact that the district court had use of statistical sampling in a nursing home case where it was absolutely essential um, to, to be able to prove up the full extent of the damage of that statistical sampling. So without that tool, um, there was a settlement quickly reached. The, the government um, uh, 
opposed that settlement. Uh, the court blocked it. It went to the Fourth Circuit. And um, the uh, Fourth Circuit determined that the Department of Justice has an unreviewable right uh, to veto FCA settlements. Um, also in accord with that ruling are the Fifth Circuit case, Searcy, and the Sixth Circuit case, U.S. v. Health Possibilities. Um, but on the other hand, there is the Killingsworth case um, out of the Ninth Circuit in 1994, which um, required a good cause hearing um, to be held, sort of, um, you know, sort of importing a standard from elsewhere. Um, so it's uh, disputes over the value of a case and what number a case should sell at are often at the heart of um, whether the government will consent to dismissal. But agape was rare in that, um, you know, a more typical reason would be, for instance, that um, the government deems that there's too much of the settlement allocated to retaliation versus a key town claim, the retaliation being the part that the government doesn't um, uh, get a share of the settlement for. Um, next slide. So then different statutory provision 3730 um, uh, 2B is um, for fairness hearings when the government, not the relator, wants to settle a case um, over the relator's objection. Um, and it is quite specific in this instance um, that the relator is entitled to a fairness hearing um, to, uh, to cover whether the proposed settlement is fair, adequate, and reasonable under all of the circumstances, um, which may be held in, in camera. And I think on a previous, uh, in a previous session, there was discussion of uh, a fairness hearing where one of the defendants had not settled. And so there was an interest in protecting that sort of information about why people wanted to settle. Um, as an example, um, and let's go to the next slide. Okay, so 31 USC 3730D um, is, is where we go to see what items need to be um, negotiated in the False Claims Act for settlement. Um, and so, uh, so first of all, there is there is the award to the, the key town plaintiff, um, which, as most of us know, is um, based on a range that differs whether the case is declined or intervened. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, relator share uh, scope. In this section, looking at 3730D, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the scope of um, a relator share award. We're going to talk about relator share percentage, so it's a little bit different and fees and expenses and retaliation. There are other considerations, um, of course, um, in uh, dealing with a, a settlement. And we're going to talk about some of those later, especially in Steve's section, um, ability to pay being um, often an important one. So um, next slide. So as far as the scope of later share, um, the statutory phrase, and it was on the previous slide also, is uh, the relayer is entitled to share on the proceeds of the action or settlement. And um, that is going to include um, any alternate remedy um, that um, the government has pursued under 3730C5, because C5 says that um, you treat that as though it is happening in the KTM action. Um, and so um, that is something um, uh, that should be sort of considered as within the scope of relator share. Uh, the tricky thing is that the relator may not always be aware of it. Um, and so that is when, when I think of what we need to worry about in a settlement agreement, it's often the items that are not there um, and that would be one of them, like, does there need to be something about alternate remedy? Um, 
Then there's covered conduct, and covered conduct is basically we're talking about the essence of the scope of the release at this point. What's the time frame? What are the claims that are going to be covered? Um, this can be crucial um, in first to file situations because it may be um, when when the, when the government pr proposes or circulates its covered conduct that may be you know um, the sort of pivotal um, thing for. Um, which relators are going to have successful first to file um, positions and, and which are not, depending on what claims make it into that covered conduct. Um, and, you know, other issues that come up with the scope of relator share um, include um, where the government has uh, in its um, complaint and intervention added claims in addition to the, uh, the key town relators claims um, such as unjust enrichment or perhaps it has um, added new claims based on um, investigation that um, the relator has assisted with perhaps um, but has not had um, and everybody you know everybody sort of learned because of maybe documents that were subpoenaed during the investigation. And so there can be disputes over that. Restitution in criminal cases, um, that would be another important issue in scope. Um, next slide. Then there is the relator share percentage itself. Um, and uh, so, this, these, um, there, there's a decent amount of case law out there on relator share percentage. Um, there are two somewhat competing sets of factors, the Senate factors versus the DOJ factors. The Senate factors deriving from legislative history and the DOJ factors um, are sort of agency guidance level uh, information, except that both have appeared in many um, decisions at this point with the DOJ factors being usually the Department of Justice's choice in my experience, but not always depending on the facts that are best for them in the particular case. Um, in general, um, we often hear that if you want a 20% minimum relator share, then your client has to have taken extraordinary measures such as wearing wire. Um, Hardship, the hardship of the relator is not otherwise um, necessarily a, a um, something that the court, that the Department of Justice focuses on, though it may be something that the court focuses on when these issues get litigated. Um, and uh, it's, it's not unusual for these to, for um, relators counsel to have to litigate these you know, successfully. Um, the, they're sort of all over the place. Um, so one, one issue I'll just mention very briefly that is completely unsettled as far as I know is um, when how you apply the factors, whether they're the Senate factors or the DOJ factors to multiple relators and how that might differ or not differ based on whether there is a first to file determination um, or not, um, where multiple relators may have a sharing agreement. Um, it, is, it is potentially sort of, an, uh, an, it encourages sharing agreements to be able to um, kind of pool the, the different, um, you know, attributes that different relators may have. Um, next slide. Okay, so moving on quickly to attorney's fees. Um, there's a lot that is that is not different about the way attorney's fees are handled in False Claims Act cases versus other kinds of cases. Um, but, and the, and the, the, the statute lays out that attorney's fees and costs are owed by the defendant in the case. Um, the issue of, uh, what rates apply and whether they are nationwide or local rates, given that most of us who do mostly False Claims Act work are sort of functioning in a, in a nationwide manner. Um, but local rates um, are what judges are used to. That is often 
um, very much a bone of contention. The slide mentions, mentions a um, very recent um, decision from Judge Raycott that was positive for relators on the issue of reasonable attorney fees. Um, next slide. Um, just a few other points about uh, attorney's fees. Um, in intervened settlements, um, in each complaint where the government intervenes, um, there may well be attorney's fees paid, but I would say that there um, is some variance across the board there. Um, and I'll mention very quickly, but it may come up again later when we talk about um, mediation. Um, most Relators Council do not share in their fee agreements their statutory attorney's fees with their clients, though some do. Um, and so they have an interest that is different from their clients with regard to attorney's fees, um, which can which causes them to need to um, parse out in, in um, the settlement what pot is which, which is often sort of, there's often a lot of pushback from defense counsel on that. Um, and so I, I see that as a sort of recurring issue. Next slide. And this will be the last that I cover briefly on retaliation. Again, there are the attorney's fees that we already talked about. Um, the statute allows for um, two times the amount of back pay, interest on the back pay, and compensation for any special damages. Um, and you know there are a number of different practical issues that relate to retaliation, um, uh, as well. You know, there's there's pain and suffering issues that you don't otherwise run into. Um, what uh, part of the settlement is wages versus non wages? Too much to talk about right now. Um, and so I will um, pass on um, the presentation to our next speaker. Thanks. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So uh, we have, thank you so much, Sarah. So we have a few topics that we're hoping to get through uh, for sort of a closer look. And the first, uh, these are them. If you have questions as we go through, please go ahead and post them in the um, questions field. I have questions for the panelists too, so I may pull from yours or I may just stick with mine. Um, but first up is um, settling a declined case. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Kirsten Mayer to address that. And apologies as one of the chairs for having put together a panel that has two Sarahs, a Kirsten and a Kirsten on it, but we're gonna get through this. And you guys are gonna know who Steve Altman is at the end of the day at least. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten, can you go ahead and, and sort of introduce the topic of settling a declined case? Thanks very much, Sarah. I'd be happy to. And it makes up for all the times I've been part of joint defense groups that consist of John, 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 and John. So I think it's okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of settling a decline case, if you just advance the slide, um, I really just have two slides here to uh, set up some basics. Um, 3730C specifies the rights of the parties here. And I think it's worth flagging, you know, the, the government, if they don't intervene, the relator has a right to conduct the action and they're the primary. Um, the government then moves into the role of third party to the case. This is something DOJ has litigated and fought for, for what it's worth. Um, it allows DOJ not to participate as completely in the litigation. As lawyers, they can monitor it, but they aren't subject to the burdens that a party faces when they're litigating a case. So they get some distinct advantages from that, and it increases the burden, frankly, on the defense and on the relator if any discovery wants to be taken of the government. Um, uh, but the court can allow DOJ or the United States um, to intervene later for good cause. And this um, can become important uh, depending on the circumstances. It's not something that is typical in a case, um, but there's a recent decision out of the Seventh Circuit um, in a setting where DOJ moved to dismiss that has sort of raised some interesting questions in my mind about whether um, this notion of intervention for good cause might be something we see a bit more of in that context, at least going forward. Um, so the government here can settle over relator's objection if a court finds the settlement fair, adequate, and reasonable, and Sarah covered that. Um, and as I just mentioned, the government can dismiss over relator's objection if the relator's notified and the court provides an opportunity to be heard. And there isn't uniformity over what that means, there's at least two different standards, and then I set possibly this um, third standard or third approach to it that the Seventh Circuit implemented um, this year. Um, and, and I know that issue has been covered in other panels, so we're not going to get into the differences in that standard. Just suffice it to say the statute itself addresses what the government can do when it's not a party. 
to the case in these contexts. And then we just have this one provision in B1 that says the case may just be dismissed um, by the relator only with the government's written consent. It's not specific to when the relator's leading the case, but it's this notion that almost no matter what setting, the government um, you know, still has a, a written consent right um, that must be exercised before a case can formally be dismissed. Flip to the next slide. So we're talking about settling a declined case. Um, these are the cases that, um, just for your reference, that uh, Sarah mentioned, and I added the dismissal without settlement over the relator's objection. With I think the UCB case is a very interesting one to look at. But it tees up questions, and, and, and I want to get to the heart of those, which is when should you bring DOJ into the discussion as the first one that I'm hoping we can talk about. Um, it's a little bit awkward. Um, if, you've, if this has been an investigated case, um, you've worked with the Department of Justice um, and worked very hard to convince them that this case has no merit, um, that there's massive litigation risk, and that they will lose if they proceed, and that justice requires uh, that this case not be intervened and pursued by the Department of Justice for all sorts of great reasons. And um, understanding that we, you know, as defense lawyers, never know what DOJ really thinks of a case, you've done this You've gone through this process and you've won, and DOJ has decided to decline to intervene in the case. Hurrah. Um, but now you move to version 2.0 of the case, which is you have a relator's lawyer who, um, you know, as brilliant as I'm sure these arguments were, and as much as they always defer to DOJ, right, Sarah? Um, uh, the relator respectfully believes that they have a really great case and pursue it and serve it and proceed. Um, so, so you move forward into discovery, and at some point it makes sense, whether it's like the agape situation or whether there are other circumstances, and you want to settle the case. Um, and Relator wants to settle the case, and you can actually potentially meet on a financial resolution that is good for all parties. So what do you do then? Do you, you know, the first time you start thinking about settlement, you know, do you need to bring DOJ back in the door, or can you proceed with the Relator for some time really in an independent way? And that's sort of the first question that I wanted to tee up. And then the second is, um, what expectations you know, should you have, um, dep maybe depending in part on how you handle the first question, around uh, whether you will get a dismissal without prejudice to the United States uh, on some or all of the claims that are at issue in the case. And this is uh, another factor that needs to be taken into account when you're trying to strategize not just about when to initiate settlement discussions with a relator in a non-intervened case, but also you know, when and how to bring the Department of Justice into the discussions. Um, and uh, this issue um, comes up when um, you're trying to resolve um, a broad False Claims Act case that the relator has pursued, when perhaps the Department of Justice or the defendant might have a different view of the law, of the facts, and might want may, might be amenable perhaps to a release on some but not all of the claims, um, and or maybe none of the claims. And so, how does this dismissal without prejudice mechanism work in the context of trying to settle a non-intervened case? How can you be caught unawares by it, and how can you use that mechanism potentially to your advantage to get over an impasse or to to resolve things in, in a better way? Um, so let me pause there, Sarah, and see if there are questions or if other panelists want to weigh in um, with some thoughts on this. Um, I, I'm happy to keep going, but I'm mindful of, of time. Yeah, um, actually, why, yeah, why don't um, Steve, Steve Altman, do you have a perspective to share on when to bring DOJ into the discussion of settling a declined case? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, first, I want to mention that when DOJ declines a case, typically they're to send a, a letter to both the Relators Council and Defense Council, and it outlines not only um, the relationship between uh, DOJ and the parties during the litigation, but uh, outlines quite a bit um, and gives a good deal of guidance about settlement and what should be in a settlement agreement. So if you have not received that letter, call the AOSA or call Maine Justice and, and ask for it because it's uh, very good guidance. Um, most of these cases, most cases settle, most decline cases settle. And because the DOJ is going to have to approve the settlement, you want to keep them apprised of what's going on. And that, that's a value to both defense counsel and to the relators counsel. Um, I have not had the, the conversation of when to bring in the DOJ lawyer since yesterday when I was talking to a, well, actually I talked to both counsel yesterday in a case that I'm mediating right now. And I said, is, is the assistant going to join us in the mediation? Is the assistant aware? Um, and they both said, oh, we're going to call him. We're, gonna, we're just about to call him. 
Um, I, I thought it was a little late, but uh, <laughs> but we have a few weeks, and uh, and uh, and it's going to vary. Some AUSAs, some main justice lawyers will say yes, I'd like to participate because we're still looking at this case. Um, sometimes DOJ has declined. Actually, they haven't declined. They have not intervened because they've run out of time and the court court has ordered them to fish or cut bait. And those cases, they may still be interested in. Uh, I have found that sometimes the DOJ and AUSA involvement can be helpful to both sides in, in, rep, rep, you know, in recognizing their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and then finally, if is there an H claim or some type of common law employment claim? Because the Department of Justice is going to look at how the money is divided up. And here you really want to have DOJ prepared in advance to know that this is an issue. And we want DOJ to understand the merits of the employment claim um, rather than because they'll take a, a good hard look at it. And they don't want to be surprised by that. Um, and um, that's <laughs> I'll leave it at that yeah. for right now. I know. I know. I we could go on forever, but um, I guess on on um, Kirsten's uh, second question about uh, a without prejudice dismissal, um, sort of when is the government willing to release claims in a in a declined action um, with prejudice as opposed to without prejudice? I mean, I'll share my experience in, in this, my personal experience in this in Maine Justice, which is that you know once we have declined a case and are not a party to it. I would really prefer not to release claims with prejudice to the United States. If if we, you know, we have decided sort of we want out of this case and we do have the legal um, sort of the, the authority, the responsibility to consent to the dismissal or not, um, if a relator wants to settle, but consenting to a dismissal um, where the relator ends the lawsuit with the defendant and moves on, um, but there's no release from the government is sort of one thing. Consenting, actually releasing claims requires me to know a whole lot about the claims, the value of the claims, to be able to justify the dollar amount to my superiors. It requires me to get all sorts of terms into the settlement agreement that are necessary to protect the government. And it's basically involving me again and involving the United States again in a case that we decided not to be involved in. So I would rather in a settlement of a declined case be just looking at it from from a very um, you know ten thousand feet and looking at the issues that Sarah Fraser described earlier. You know, is there an allocation of money here that suggests something untoward is going on? You know, all the money is going to relators' attorneys' fees and or a retaliation claim rather than and, and no money is going to the United States in a case that's supposedly about a fraud on the United States. And that's that's the kind of thing I would like to be looking at in a decline case rather than you know look valuing the case to in order to give government releases we do do that sometimes um but i would say that that is less common than uh just doing a settlement that uh, where there's a, a dismissal with prejudice to the relator and without prejudice to the united states i don't know kirsten nedwick have you had the same experience on the um state side um yes i mean i would say that the key on the state side of the house is similar to the federal government with the key question being is, are the state governments being adequately compensated for the alleged um, conduct that's under consideration for settlement? So I have seen it both ways in decline cases. We've of course vetted the damage models on the state side of the house to, to ensure that they do adequately compensate the states um, for the conduct. In which case, if we're getting paid for a release, we will of course dismiss with prejudice on the flip side of that, I've also seen cases where we um, are willing to dismiss without prejudice um, under certain circumstances. So, I've, and I've even seen some cases recently, as I'm sure you have as well, Sarah, where there is some nominal payment made um, to, to the state and federal governments um, for the dismissal without prejudice, kind of to your point, to get the, the case moving and resolved to all the parties. Sarah, okay. Could I add that, uh, what about a cold comfort letter? If you, uh, if the government will not uh, give the release with prejudice, uh, will they give a cold comfort letter that says at this time, they're not, they don't have any current plan to continue an investigation and, and uh, bring an action? 
I think that's worth discussing, um, and it probably would have to be figured out case by case, but that is, we do do that sometimes where we have claims that we're not actually prepared to release on behalf of the United States, but we will at least say, look, we're not pursuing this. Although, frankly, if we've declined a case, we're not pursuing it. So that was what we told the court that already. But we could tell, we could potentially tell the defendant that in a letter, sure. Um, be it worth asking, you know, and depend on the facts. I think, unfortunately, we need to move on if we're going to get through uh, our topic. So um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Kristen next to talk about multi-state residents. Thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon. Uh, today, I'll be briefly visiting with you about multi-state resolutions in the context of healthcare fraud matters, in particular, those that relate to Medicaid fraud. Um, next slide, please. So in the healthcare fraud cases, most multi-state resolutions result from QUITOM lawsuits that name both the federal government and then in addition, multiple states. So what this slide that you are looking at right now um, is showing you are the various states that have QUITOM statutes, many of which are similar to the Federal False Claims Act. The states on the dark blue slot side of the slide are representative of states that have what I would call a broad um, False Claims Act statute um, that are similar to the Federal False Claims. On the not the light blue side of the house, those are states that have a statute that's more limited in scope. So, for example, the Texas statute is uh, pertains only to fraud matters in the context of the Texas Medicaid program. Um, next slide, please. Fortunately, in the healthcare fraud arena, we have the benefit of an organization called the National Association of Medicaid Fraud Control Units. And what this organization has done, I think, extremely successfully um, has been able to set processes in place to help facilitate um, both the investigation phases and settlement phases of these multi-state um, and federal QUITOM cases that are filed across the countryside. Through NAMFUKU, what we generally do is appoint a state team that is comprised of attorneys and analysts from across the country. Those attorneys and analysts can be from states that were named um, in a particular QUITOM action. They can also be from states that do not have QUITOM statutes, for example, Oregon and Ohio, simply because they may have been significantly impacted by the conduct that's at issue and the potential resolution. Next slide, please. So what's the role of the Nanfuku team? Um, basically, the, the state team will represent the interest of all states in both a pre-intervention um, decision matter as well as in a decline matter. So when a state team comes to work with both the federal government, the um, Relators Council and, De and Defense Council, we would be representing the interest of all the potentially impacted Medicaid states. That state team will coordinate on the um, investigation, which would include the damage model that development, um, which is very pertinent in the settlement phase. They also work on an allocation model of if the settlement is reached, how will those proceeds be distributed amongst the Medicaid states? They draft the model settlement agreement and they oversee the entire execution process as to any states that may be potentially settling um, states. And at the end of the day, it's the state team that will distribute the Medicaid proceeds to any state that opts in to that particular settlement. Next slide, please. So what I've done in the next two slides is try to um, highlight some key considerations from the state's perspective. Um, the first one is just on the settlement process in general. Uh, it's important to remember, and sometimes we have a little bit of a misunderstanding on this, when a case is being resolved in a multi-state context on the Medicaid side of the house, um, we will have a separate state agreement for any state that is a potential settling state. So there won't just be one settlement agreement that all the states sign on to for the state share of a Medicaid recovery. We will be sending out as many as 53 settlement agreements 
if we have 50 states that are impacted, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. So it can be an enormous undertaking on the part of the state team to facilitate um, the distribution of those settlement packets and then the return of those settlement agreements as well. And the other key point during the settlement process is just it can take up to 60 days for a state to return an agreement. Um, my state is one of those that has a little bit extra um, line to jump over. We not only have our AG sign off on settlement agreements, we also have our single state agency sign off. So we ask for 60 day turnaround period just to get it kind of through those state approval processes. I bring up briefly that um, federal medical assistance percentage um, and state percentage on the next bullet because I think it's important, especially in um, decline cases or where expert damage, experts in damage modeling are brought in, um, it's important to understand that because Medicaid is jointly funded by the federal government and the state Medicaid programs, that any proceeds that are derived from a settlement of Medicaid claims is also shared between the federal government and the state. And that comes into play in particular when you have a state that has a QUITOM statute, like the ones that I showed you on that previous slide, um, because any state that has been deemed what we refer to as Section 1909 compliant, which is a determination that's made by HHS OIG, that that state statute meets certain requirements as set forth by OIG, then that state is entitled to an additional 10% recovery on the Medicaid share of a recovery. And so essentially what's happening is 10% of the recovery is shifting from the federal side over to the state side. And the published rates that you see online do not reflect that additional 10% that a state may be entitled to. So I just bring that to your attention if you're working on any type of allocation modeling, that that would be something that would need to be factored into your ana analysis. Next slide, please. Um, managed care, just want to bring to everyone's attention that on the state side of the house, um, we do take a look at both fee-for-service claims and managed care claims. Many states have moved to a healthcare delivery system in the Medicaid world that is based in the Medicaid managed care world. So defendants generally, Kirsten would be better able to speak to this, but the, defend, the defendant companies that I've mostly worked with, they are seeking a Medicaid release as to the managed care claims. And so again, that's a consideration for folks that are working on damage modeling. You would wanna make sure that those claims are part of the model that you are entertaining. And that is something that the state teams do include in their damage modeling. And last but not least, relator share, um, near and dear to Sarah's heart, um, Sarah with the H. Um, we just wanna make sure that sometimes it's a little bit conflu confusing on the relator side of the house when we're doing a multi-state settlement with the federal government that involves Medicare, TRICARE, um, and Medicaid, um, as I said earlier, the state teams will be representing the interest of all the states. So theoretically, we could have states join a settlement that is a non quitom state. And on the state share side of the recovery, those states would not be obligated to pay a relator share. Of course, on the federal side of that Medicaid recovery, there would be um, a, a relator share payable, but not on the non quitom state uh, recovery. Any state that's properly named and served um, in the underlying quitom complaint, those states, of course, would be liable um, to pay a relator share for particular parts of the covered conduct that's uh, being resolved under the settlement. So if anybody has any questions on any of these topics, please feel free to reach out to me. I think you have your um, contact information for all of us. And with that, I think we move on to the next segment of this presentation. Yeah, actually, no, actually, before we do, thank you so much, um, Kristen. But before we do, um, Kirsten Nedwick, could you comment on sort of multi-state resolutions from the defense perspective? Um, what are some of the unique challenges? Sure. I, again, I, I think just to be brief here, um, 
I think most the, the most significant challenge with multi-state settlements is the logistics. Um, a lot of times the primary negotiation with a government settlement will be with DOJ, although it, uh, DOJ is great about including there will be a Mifuku representative who participates in those discussions for the broader multi-state group. Um, the National Mifuku usually creates kind of a working group for significant cases, and then we'll have a representative that participates. And sometimes there's multiple interested state AG representatives who are on the phone, or I guess it's Zoom these days, who participate in those discussions um, uh, as they get going. So I, I, I really do think logistics is the biggest. Um, the second thing to watch out for is there are uh, states who sometimes have programs that will believe that they're entitled to some additional funding. And if you've done your modeling really focused on Medicaid, um, even aside from the managed care piece of it, sometimes there are individual states who have their own sort of quirky programs that need some additional money. And if you're not anticipating that, um, it can slow things down. And if you have a client who feels like they're in this never ending ending to the Lord of the Rings uh, saga where you've defeated Sauron and you still have a thousand pages to go before the book is over. Um, uh, to borrow an analogy from Paul Kaufman, a former EDNY guy who's now at um, in-house, um, it, 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 your client can, can drive him bonkers. And so from my side, I'm trying to move things along as quickly as possible. Those are two significant things um, from the settlement perspective. Sarah Frazier, um, anything from the relator's perspective to add to that? Or do you face the same challenges on the relator's end that uh, Kirsten just described? Yes, it can get very complicated. Um, it used to be even more complicated when we had uh, new state False Claims Act um, act getting enacted and um, you had to deal with issues of retroactivity. And, you know, it's still sort of, you know, Kristen was kidding when she mentioned um, service as a requirement. Um, you know, I've I've had that there are there are a couple of states that have personal service requirements that are um, sort of gotchas, um, and so you know all of a sudden Colorado falls out of your um, damage model. Um, but uh, but as complicated as those issues are, you know, Super really does um, sort out a whole lot of it on their own, and um, it's it's very important to be in good contact with them and um, develop those relationships from a helpful perspective. Terrific. And um and Kristen, is there a um is there an equivalent in a case there are there are quitams that are not healthcare related that involve many states. Uh, is there some sort of representative or team from the states that can be enlisted to represent the states in those negotiations? You know, that's an interesting question, Sarah. Um, those are probably those states that have the broad statutes that we talked about on that earlier slide. I am not aware of any type of organization similar to the to the Namfuku organization that um, puts teams together. Now, with that said, I do know that on the antitrust and consumer side, they do work together and put teams of um, attorneys together to work on resolving um, matters in those contexts. So I would think um, I, that there are probably certain states out there that are able to coordinate um, a group activity amongst states that might be impacted by the types of allegations that you're talking about outside the Medicaid context. But I'm not aware of an official organization that's as formalized as the Namfuku organization. Thanks. Uh, I am going to move us along, and um, our next topic is False Claims Act mediation, and we're going to uh, let Steve talk about that a bit. And actually, could the rest of the panelists mute their lines, because I'm getting a little bit of feedback that might be easier for uh, Okay, Sarah, um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to cover sort of three broad topics, and you have the slides, and you've got uh, – some written materials that I've submitted that uh, will go into some more detail. And before I do that, oh, I, I do have to add my condolences to Jack Basie's family and, and those like myself who were just so fond of him. And I'll, apropos of this, of this panel, I have to add that he used to say that regarding uh, False Claims Act resolutions, he was a pilgrim. He referred to himself as an early settler. His, he, thought, he thought it was in the best interest of his clients to settle cases before a great deal of money and, and, and time and uh, effort was, was wasted on litigation. Uh, with that, 
Um, I want to I want to just mention sort of some broad issues. And the first thing is when you go into mediation, think about why you're in mediation. Now I know a lot of you will. There's two broad answers. One is the judge told us we had to, and the second one is because the lawyers on the other side don't understand their case. Um, and, and of course, you hear that from both sides. Uh, even even if you're told you're there because the judge told you to, keep in mind. Um, why didn't you just sit down and negotiate this? Why do you need a mediator? Is it uh, that there are multiple parties involved? Is it that there are parallel proceedings and administrative things and you just need help coordinating everything? Do you want to save time and money? Uh, is it the emotions? Uh, you know, we think the relators can be emotional. The corporations that are being are charged with the fraud can be emotional. Um, do you have you, have the lawyers just have poor communication? Have they lost trust? Uh, so that they can't communicate. The, the reason I emphasize thinking about why you're in the, in the process is it influences the skill set you want to hire. It, in, it influences how you prepare yourself, how you prepare your client, and uh, you know, and, and how you prepare the mediator. Um, and uh, and it influences the strategy you're going to use in the mediation. So give some thought to why you're there and share that with the mediator. Um, it's important for them to to help uh, to help you uh, prepare with that background. Uh, secondly, a couple of the kind of the must things to consider. Uh, what are you going to negotiate? There's the scope of the release, which I encourage people to do early rather than after you've got a handshake on money. If 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 you're paying, if the defense is paying money to buy a release, they ought to know what they're buying before they spend the money. Um, whether or not there's a, an ability to pay, you may be mediating that. Uh, there are new rules and procedures and guidance on how the department is going to handle ability to pay cases. Uh, are there administrative remedies? Uh, you know, the DOJ is not going to uh, resolve suspension debarment issues. Um, and you're going to have to do that separately with the agency. Do you want to do that at the same time? Sometimes DOJ will agree that uh, we'll give you 60 days to work out the administrative. We'll make the, the, the settlement agreement we've got a handshake on is contingent on you resolving the administrative issues in the next 60 days. Sometimes that's available. Is there an H claim? Are you going to be mediating that at the same time? And the attorney's fees. And on the attorney's fees, the last thing that the government wants or the relator wants is the defendant to say, here's $3 million to settle this. It covers the attorney's fees you government and relator figure out how you're going to divide that up. That is not helpful uh, to the government or the relator. Uh, and sometimes not to the defendant. Well, it is helpful to the defendant to say that. But that's a, that's a touchy subject. Uh, and you can talk to the mediator about how to resolve that as, you, as the process goes along. Finally, are there contract remedies? Now uh, the amount of restitution uh, is going to be uh, a subject of the negotiation, whether in your mediation or not, uh, all of those things you want to have uh, a mediator that that is aware of these issues uh, and will make sure they all get covered. Um, who should attend? Uh, should the relator attend? Uh, my, you know, of course the answer is it depends. But my rule of thumb is if you think the relator is going to be a problem, a problem in the negotiation, a problem after the negotiation, then you probably want a mediator's help in, in getting the, medi the, the relator on board, uh, or if not on board, just understanding the, the pros and cons in the situation. Um, uh, finally, of course, it depends on whether or not, you know, is, the, is this a decline case and do you want the government to attend? Um, and a word on, we always say, you're supposed to come to mediation with the authority to settle. Well. In False Claims Act cases, the relator usually has the authority to settle. The government never does. Um, and it is very common for large corporations not to have someone at the table that has, they'll have authority. They'll, someone will have said, all right, you've got $6 million to settle this case. Um, well, maybe it'll take $7 million to settle the case, and they don't have the authority to go to $7 million. I don't require, and I don't even encourage, people to come with a preset number of uh, that they have for authority because um, it's hard to go back to the board of directors or to the supervisor in, in, your, in the U.S. Trade's office or at Maine Justice and say, you know, I know you gave me authority to sell this at $6 million, 
well, we're going to have to move it a million dollars. It's, it's, I'd rather have people come to the, to the mediation um, with the honest representation that they're going to make a recommendation. Their recommendations are usually followed um, and we'll just, uh, we'll proceed with that. I, I don't want either the corporation or the government to give, to make the decision on what this should settle for without the value of the mediation. Uh, so that's why I don't insist on people with having prior authority to come. And finally, just strategy is um, um, work with the mediator before you get to the table. Uh, spend some time with your clients, with the mediator, um, deciding, planning the mediation. Uh, don't just show up and, uh, and, and wing it. Uh, also, uh, how much education should be done before you, you get to the table, uh, we, before you get together? I encourage, you know, we all will send a, a memorandum to the mediator saying this is, this is our case. 80%, 90% of that memo could have been sent to the other side. And sometimes that's really valuable. And I'll, as the mediator, I'll encourage people, why don't you exchange those? Why do we spend time educating each other at the mediation when this education can be done beforehand and everybody will be better prepared to discuss the, have a, a more meaningful discussion of the issues? Um, with that, I mean, we do, uh, I'll add just a, a point on the relator's participation. Um, you know, obviously, if there's an H claim, the relator should be there. Uh, if you want to do, resolve it, you don't have to resolve all those at the same time, but it certainly most defendants want to know this is over. What's it going to take totally to get this matter uh, dealt with? Um, so, and that includes the, the fees, as I mentioned. Um, and, you know, as it says in the next slide, whether or not the relator is a, uh, an important witness, the relationship the relators had with the government, uh, the amount of time, uh, you know, is the relator an, an active participant in the relator's counsel, I should say, an active participant in the litigation. Those are all things that are going to impact whether or not the relator attends the, the actual mediation. Um, with that, I know, Sarah, we're, we're pressed for time, so I'm going to stop there. Okay, great. I think I'm just going to move us on to our, um, to our next hot topic. Thank you so much, Steve. And um, our materials include not just the PowerPoint, but also a number of handouts, including several that Steve prepared on mediation that I would urge everyone to make sure that they take a look at. Um, they're, they're really very, very valuable. Um, so, Courtney, could you, would you please advance the slides? Um, keep going. One more. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about a few um policy developments on the main justice end um, that folks should be aware of. Uh, also, actually, before I get to that, my co-panelist asked me to make sure that you're aware of probably the most significant um, policy constraint on settlement on the DOJ end, which is our standard settlement terms. Uh, there are a lot of them. And in your um, materials, there are a couple of sample settlement agreements that are really there because they illustrate one of these policy developments. But um, you can see um, there's a healthcare settlement and a non-healthcare settlement, and you can see that there are a lot. There's a lot of language in there that's the same across both of those agreements. And you're going to hear if you negotiate settlements with DOJ lawyers about a lot of language that they just can't change. And when I say DOJ lawyers, I mean Maine Justice and Assistant U.S. Attorneys. And you may find that um, Maine Justice has policies on the language. Uh, you may find that the U.S. Attorney's Office you're dealing with has additional policies on top of the main justice policies. So when they tell you that things can't be changed, they really are um, serious about it. And I will also say in my own experience, every time you say something can't be changed, somebody shows you a settlement where somebody did change it and, you know, oh, well, I, I cannot change it because it was not supposed to have ever been changed. So um, so there's that. I mean, the big things to negotiate um, in a settlement in the in settlement language are the money, the amount of money involved and the conduct that's going to be released. Those are going to be the big the big negotiating points, and a lot of the rest of it is going to have to be the way it always is. Um, so back to the policy developments that are new. Um, there are two that I wanted to mention to you. Um, there's a policy, a DOJ policy, that's in the Justice Manual on Disclosure, Cooperation, and Remediation. Uh, and then uh, that's from May 2019. And then there's a policy from very recently, September 2020, on um, handling uh, inability to pay assertions from defendants, and that's going to be in the Justice Manual. 
Can you advance the slide, please, Courtney? So the policy on um, disclosure, cooperation, and remediation, and I know some other some other panels have mentioned this, so I'll just be brief, but um, the basic concept is that a defendant can earn credit for uh, real disclosure, real cooperation, and real remediation. So uh, that does not mean, you know, you find the defendant finds out that the government is onto them, you know, the government's subpoenaing information about a topic, and then the government, then the defendant goes and discloses that, oh, they have this issue involving that same topic. Um, it does not mean, you know, remediation does not mean showing the compliance program that a defendant already has. Cooperation does not mean just responding to a subpoena, you know, lawfully issued subpoena, which is a legal requirement anyway. Um, it's, it's, we're looking in, in the policy, which is also in your materials, and it's available on the website, on the internet, and in the justice manual, um, lays out that we're looking for more significant cooperation than that, um, and more significant um, disclosure and remediation. Uh, a big thing that I have seen is, um, is, the, is on the disclosure end. Uh, I have seen disclosures that come during an investigation, but of information that was not uh, already under investigation. So a, a new topic brought to the attention of the government. And I think we got these kinds of disclosures even before the policy, but certainly we're getting them now. Um, that is something that a defendant can get credit for. Um, and remediation, you know, also even before the policy. I mean, you know, obviously a defendant hires, you know, Kirsten to come in and deal with a potential False Claims Act problem. And I assume that one of Kirsten's you know, top priorities is to make sure that it's not a continuing, you know, the, the bleeding does not continue and something, you know, something changes. And so um, a defendant can earn cooperation credit or for that remediation credit for that. The policy is very clear that um, the credit that is given should not result in the government receiving less than full compensation for its losses. So it's important to recognize full compensation doesn't just mean the return of the single damages, because if there's a QUITAM case, the government has to pay a relator share on top of that. The uh, measure of the single damages doesn't include interest, you know, time value of money. It doesn't include the cost of investigation. So, um, so the credit, which is frequently going to be a financial credit, is likely to be a reduction of the multiplier, but it's not going to be likely be a reduction of the multiplier down to no multiplier. Um, probably something more like a 1.5 times multiplier rather than something more than that is what would, would be likely um, to be envisioned. And um, the policy also says that maximum credit is reserved for situations where um, there's information provided about all of the individuals involved. And this is sort of hearkening back to what had been the existing policy before then under the prior administration um, that was in what was called the Yates Memo um, to do with individual accountability, which had previously said there's no cooperation credit at all unless a company discloses the involvement of all individuals, including you know, the top level people in the corporation. So that is still what is required to get maximum credit, but now under the policy, you can get partial credit. Courtney, could you um, advance the slide, please? And uh, what I did wanna make sure people knew about is that this policy is, um, it is being implemented. I mean, it was, uh, it was announced in May, 2019, and there are examples, and I put them in the slides, of settlements and press releases that reflect um, the implementation of the policy. So, for example, this Medtronic settlement, and you have the whole agreement in your materials. Um, the, the press release and the settlement itself called out um, the remedial steps that the company had taken. And if you can, um, firing certain people, um, among other things. And if you can, uh, please advance the slides, Courtney. Here's a list of other settlements and all, all of these press releases you can find on the um, DOJ website. The Industries for the Blind and Visually Impaired Settlement I included in the, uh, in the materials for you. And you can see that that references cooperation um, being given. So among the policies that we have about settlement, DOJ will not negotiate the content of a press release, but it is our practice and a policy to not put things in the press release that are not in a public document already. So the negotiation point for this is over the amount of money that a defendant is going to pay, where, you know, could that be reduced um, because of cooperation credit? And then what's going to be put in the um, settlement agreement itself? Um, and then what, from what goes in the settlement agreement can flow what ends up in a press release later. I mean, that is, that's my practical advice about where where this comes in in terms of, a, in terms of um, the actual negotiations that folks will have. Courtney, can you give us the next slide? 
Thanks. And I'm just going to mention this very briefly because we're really out of time. But um, the other policy is one from September 2020 on ability to pay settlements. And you have this policy in your materials as well. Um, it really outlines um, the department's practice on looking at uh, ability to pay when a defendant can't pay a merits-based settlement. And the practice is, and as, as outlined in the memo and has been for a long time, that um, we will have a qualified financial analyst take a look at a whole bunch of financial disclosures, ask a lot of questions, and evaluate what the defendant is saying about what it really can pay um, to settle, you know, what it can afford to pay. Uh, generally, we're looking at a five-year um, payment plan, and it's important to be aware that the settlement agreement that gets signed at the end of the day is going to represent that the information that was provided is current, accurate, and complete, and that's that's going to be as of the when the settlement is signed. Um, so it's not a this is not a this is not really a negotiation. It's not a it's not a negotiation like other settlement negotiations where there's posturing from each side and horse trading to get to the middle. This is an attempt by both sides to really come to a uh, an understanding and to help the government's financial analysts come to an understanding of uh, what the defendant's finances really do show. Uh, one factor, if you can go to the next slide, Courtney. Um, thanks. One factor that's considered is contingency arrangements, and I will say that we've been dealing with a, a lot with that in this COVID-19 environment. We've got a lot of defendants who are in terrible financial straits, and that's understandable. And there's been an effort to come up with payment plans over this sort of five, three to five year horizon that will uh, deal with the difficult financial straits, but at the same time, if the situation improves, try to allow the government to get some of the upside of that. So that is all the time we have. I really thank our panelists um, for being here. Um, really, really appreciate everybody's thoughts. Um, and on behalf of the ABA and the criminal justice section, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Please join us uh, tomorrow at 12 Eastern for our first session, which is uh, developments in healthcare fraud. Thank you very much.